Welcome back to World War II TV and another one of our myth shows. Well, Adolf Hitler was without question one of history's most despicable and monstrous individuals. But that said, were the defeats of the German military all his fault? Well, to tackle that is World War II TV regular Prit Buttar, author of a slew of fabulous books about World War II. They are nearly all linked below. It's one of the longest entries I have to do when I do a Prit Buttar Prit show. Uh, there's Meat Grind, one of them. I'm not going to bring the whole lot in there because all the other books on the shelves fall over if I take them all out there. So uh, I'm going to bring uh, Prit in now. So let's discuss this one. So good evening. How are you today, sir? I'm very well indeed. Um, it's been a, a busy, busy day. And um, yeah, carry on as, we, as we've been going. It's great. Well, brilliant. So, the, 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 as you heard me say there, the notion is is that Hitler was responsible for absolute, absolutely every single military failure. And you know, I know you're going to present the case of the, the the generals who survived, and that's where that's where we are with this. Is that post-war writing about the war by people who influenced countless generations? So, basically, uh, I'm going to hand it over to to my distinguished guest to kind of explain the reality of this. So, over to you, sir. Thank you very, very much. Um, I think, yes, it, it's worth saying to start with, as you say, um, Hitler was um, not one of history's um, good guys. Um, in fact, he was not one of history's competent guys. But as a result, he makes a superb fall guy for all the survivors to blame for or whatever they want to blame him for. And I'm going to concentrate on um, two absolutely outstanding examples. And I think I'd start just by a bit of um, stage setting here. I think there is this word that gets banded around an awful lot called historiography, which is essentially the study of history and how study, uh, how, how history evolves and, and why different cultures adopt different attitudes to history. So if you look at post-war historiography, you end up with two very different schools of thought on um, on the history of, of the war. First of all, you have the Western narrative, and then secondly, you have the Soviet narrative. The Soviet narrative was very much that um, the defeat of Nazism was a victory of the Soviet Union over the fascists through the infallible leadership of the Communist Party, in turn infallibly led by Comrade Stalin. Okay, everything else was massaged into fitting that. And it's very, very easy to mock this until you start looking very closely at the Western narrative that grew, the Western historiography, and you realize actually it's just as flawed. So the context of all of this is that the Western narrative grew up during the Cold War years at a time when it was very important to try to rehabilitate um, West Germany in, um, into the new, uh, newly developing NATO, and also where um, any accounts coming from the other side were naturally suspect because that's what the Soviets say, and now they're the enemies. As a result, I think that the... Um, look at this, I even get tea delivered to me. How good is this? <laughs> and a glass of whiskey. Thank Fantastic. You. Um, this, this is service, I tell you. This is great. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, you know, you have this is an era where the German generals are writing their narratives and their, their memoirs, and they're getting translated into the English language, and they are being accepted on both sides of the Atlantic almost without question. Um, a because of the there is a political imperative, and B because to question them is to say that actually the Sovs may be right. And no one's going to say that in the Cold War. So I'm going to pick on two individuals who um, I think have a reputation that is, to an extent, deserved, but is also actually grossly overrated. Recently, there has been some reanalysis of good old Heinz Gudelian, and there is an understanding that, to an extent, his reputation as the father of the panzer divisions, etc., cetera, um, is based upon his own writing. And he is a very, very good self-publicist. He quite shockingly stole ideas from a lot of his contemporaries, didn't give them any credit for it, and just said it was all his idea. And that's fantastic. You know, if you can get away with it, go for it. But ultimately, you will get caught out. So I just want to... Um, I just want to, to pick on a couple of items from Guderian, which I think highlight some of the flaws in him. And, and the whole point of this is to encourage the, uh, the listeners and the viewers to be much more critical when they read um, autobiographies and, um, 
uh, and and memoirs. Uh, Dennis Showalter, the late Dennis Showalter, great um, North American historian, he fantastically summed this up in a lovely phrase where he said, um, any memoir could be retitled as the story of a hero by one who knows him best. <laughs> and, you know, Guderian absolutely does that. So let's talk about this man and how much he tried to blame on Hitler. So immediately we're into 1941 and the, the drive into the Soviet Union and aiming for Moscow. So first of all, according to Guderian, um, it's Hitler's fault that um, army group centers, panzer uh, groups are sent north and south um, after um, the Battle of Smolensk rather than pressing on to Moscow. He then blames the one month hiatus on uh, the Führer and says this is all his fault and he should have paid attention to what the generals were saying. So the problem with this is that the one month delay had been built into the, um, the German timetable even before Barbarossa began. There had been every intention of having a logistic pause so that the troops could regroup, get resupplied, railways could be repinned to a European gauge, etc, etc, etc. There was nothing new on this. There was always going to be a delay, but it was convenient now to blame it on Hitler. <clears throat> the second thing is, actually, Moscow was never the original aim of Barbarossa. Barbarossa actually divided um, its aims into several categories. Uh, category one was the destruction of the Red Army within a couple of hundred kilometers of the frontier. Category two was the securing of both flanks, Leningrad in the north, Ukraine in the south. Category three was Moscow. In other words, we're going to go for Moscow when we're pretty much done and dusted and we can do the job with impunity. <clears throat> the problem was that the generals never really bought into this. And they always believed, and Halder was a, a prime example of this, that once the battle begins, it'll be too fluid and, and fast moving for the Fuhrer to keep up. So that'll be just fine. And we'll be able to bamboozle him and we'll get to Moscow. And, you know, during the, uh, but even during that, one month pause. Guderian is still planning the Bryansk offensive. And when Kluger challenges him on this, he says to him rather cheekily, well, we mustn't forget what the direction that Moscow lies in. And that's when uh, Kluger makes his famous comment of all of your operations hang on a thread. Anyway, so then they turn south, they knock over Kiev, um, and they capture an enormous number of Soviet prisoners there. And here's another key point here. I think in 1941, Hitler probably understood much better than Guderian and Bock and a couple of other senior officers, that there is a difference between what current NATO doctrine describes as terrain focus and enemy focus. You can conduct an operation based on terrain focus, but if the enemy's forces remain intact, uh, there is every opportunity for them to defy you and actually to turn this against you. On the other hand, you can concentrate on an enemy focus without any regard to terrain, and you'll miss opportunities to seize key bits of terrain, uh, road junctions, railway junctions, etc. Um, so the, the magical blend is to have both. And in a way, the problem was that there was too much polarization here. Anyway, so they turn south, they roll over um, Budyoni at Kiev, and they slaughter an awful lot of uh, Soviet troops. They capture even more, who unfortunately then mainly die before Christmas because of the appalling treatment of prisoners of war. And then we're on to the Battle of Moscow, and this is where Guderian goes absolutely overboard in his memoirs. And how, um, you know, uh, here we go, I'm, I'm attacking with the second panzer group, I were they second panzer army by then? Possibly. Um, but anyway, um, off they go. And he's complaining bitterly about the lack of support, the lack of supplies, etc. Um, then comes the final gasp, the last assault towards uh, Moscow. Um, Zhukov unleash, unleashes his counterattack. And, and this is where I think Guderian's reputation starts to unravel. So second panzer group or second panzer army starts withdrawing um, back to its start line without any discussion with its neighbours and without even informing its northern neighbour that it's pulling back, which to my mind is absolutely inexcusable for any field officer. And I don't really care whether you're a second lieutenant or whether you're a general. You know, you've got to tell your neighbours what you're doing. And he absolutely exposes his neighbours. 
Um, he blames Hitler for not providing winter uniforms, etc. He provide he blames him for inadequate supplies, inadequate ammunition, not replacing his lost tanks, etc. Without any regard for the fact that he should have known full well you're operating at the end of these enormous supply lines. What do you expect? And in fact. Winter uniforms were provided. The trouble was they were sitting in railway sidings outside Warsaw because the limited railway capacity was required to ship ammunition and food up to the front line. You can't have both. You don't have enough railway capacity. And someone's already commented on the tyranny of logistics. And I dare say it may have come up in a previous Mythbuster. But in many respects, the traditional German general staff officer just did not understand logistics in the same way that British and American officers understood it. And after the war, during his interrogations with the Americans, Halder even said things like, um, oh, but you cannot allow logistics to limit the operational art. And I'm kind of left scratching my head and thinking, do you really want to think about what you've just said here? You know, <laughs> In what way can your operational art be fulfilled if you don't look after your logistics? If you don't have the fuel and the ammunition and the food, you can be as the greatest um, operational artist in the world. You're not going to do anything, you know. So he blamed um, Hitler for all of that. He had this enormous row with Hitler and he gets sacked and he goes off Achilles-like to, to sulk in his tent um, while the battle goes on. After... Um, Stalingrad, Hitler recalls him as Inspector General of uh, Panzer uh, Forces uh, or, or uh, 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 Schneller Truppen. And OK, he does a reasonable job in that. Um, he helps rearm the Panzer divisions. He helps uh, he helps reorganize them, restructure them into actually a more logical and more reasonable structure. And also, I think a key thing here is he keeps the size of Panzer divisions relatively small, which actually reflects the overall skill levels of many of the people who are now commanding these divisions. There's no point in having these enormous divisions that actually you need to be a core commander to handle properly. So, OK, that's fine. But even when he is Inspector General of the Panzer Truppen, he wastes an enormous amount of effort trying to secure control over all of the Sturmgeschutz uh, uh, Abteilungen because he wants those and he doesn't want the artillery to have them. Whereas the artillery men are saying, but no, these belong to us. And again, it's just a waste of time. And he blames Hitler for not listening to him. And Hitler's attitude is, you've got a job to do. Just get on with your job. So then we get to July 1944 and the failed attempt to kill Hitler. And I have a real axe to grind about this on both of our characters tonight. So, brief pause, sorry. No problem. We're, we're loving it. Hanging oh, off every word. That is lovely. That is a um, glass of Bal Blair. For those of you who like Ooh. it, scotch, look up Bal Blair. It'll cost you an arm and a leg, but trust me, it is worth every single penny. It's outstanding. Anyway, so when you get to the July plot, both of our um, contenders tonight were well aware of what was going on. They did nothing to take part in it. And that is something that I find very difficult to comprehend because they've both written by now, that, oh, the war is over, we're losing. And it's all down to that pesky Fuhrer. But they won't actually do anything to get rid of the guy. This is the only mm. way you're ever going to get rid of He's never going to step back and just say, oh, well, you know, um, sorry, guys, I screwed up. The only way you were ever going to remove him was to kill him. And they both backed off that. And in the case of Guderian, I think his reputation is irreparably damaged by what follows after that. So he becomes chief of the general staff. He enforces the Nazification of, um, of the Wehrmacht, the adoption of the Hitler salute. He enforces the expulsion of senior officers so they can face the honor court and all of the appalling punishments that go with it. Um, he pursues officers, for example, the men who um, were court-martialed for giving up um, uh, giving up Warsaw in 1945. He insisted on their prosecution, even though it would have been utterly stupid to carry on holding the so-called fortress on the Vistula when the rest of the front would have been torn to pieces. Um, and, you know, he says, oh, well, Hitler appointed me and told me I didn't have permission to uh, resign. Oh, come on. You know, he could just have said to the Fuhrer, no, I'm not doing this. And the Fuhrer would have said, fine, you're sacked. You end up in the same place. 
you know. And to my mind, his hands are very, very dirtied by that. He, I don't think he did enough to protect his fellow officers. I think he should have been. Uh, if he was genuinely of the opinion that the war was being lost and it was all Hitler's fault, money and mouth time, he should have backed the conspirators. I'm not saying they would have succeeded if he had backed them. I'm not even saying they would have been brilliant if... Um, you know, uh, if they'd been in power, but that was the one opportunity and he bottled it. After the war, he did not face any war crimes trials. He got away with it on the, the uh, excuse of, well, I didn't witness any Jews being gassed, so I, how can I be blamed? Are you kidding me? Are you really telling me he had no idea what was going on in the rear area? He would have seen the commissar order and the severity order. He would have passed them on. And, you know, to my mind, yeah, he got off rather lightly and he got to write his memoirs. He's a very good writer, no question. But my goodness, when you look closely, I think those are quite suspect. Um, undoubtedly, in his closing time and even before that, he had some good stand up rows with um, the Fuhrer, and that's fantastic. Um, actually, this, uh, for the, those who are asking, this is only um, a five year old, but the 12 year old is absolutely outstanding. But anyway. <laughs> Back to, let's um, get the important stuff out of the way. Yeah, let's, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm cherry picking the questions here, you'll have noticed. <laughs> so anyway, that's my view of Guderian. He says it was all Hitler's fault. And I'm left thinking, actually, mate, you're just covering up for some, up for some of your own inadequacies. Talking of which, let's get on to the next man. So Manstein, this is the great strategist. This is the great hero. This is a man who, you know, could have won the war if he had been given control. Uh-huh, right. Many of you will have read this book, and I've got to say, I read it years and years and years ago um, when I was, um, I almost said infinitely younger. It feels like that way sometimes. But yeah, when I when I would read this, you know, page by page, and I page, and I'd just be saying, oh man, this is great. This is just absolutely on the money. So let's look at this guy's reputation. Undoubtedly, you know, as the father of the May 1940 campaign, absolute genius. Good job. Well done. He also was very innovative. He was actually responsible for the creation of the Sturmgeschütz. This is the guy who um, said we need self-propelled artillery for the infantry because that's my experience of the First World War. Um, and he's absolutely right. That's what they needed. And he did a good job on that. Um, he also improvised when um, in the Battle of France when he had an, uh, an ordinary army corps, but he managed to create his own mobile group in order to be able to advance as fast as a panzer division. And he did a grand job on that. So, so far, so good. Great stuff. When we get to the Eastern Front, again, he, he now commands a panzer corps and in the invasion of Lithuania, absolutely outstanding. He does a grand job. Um, he recognizes when, um, I, I think it was 8th Panzer Division, uh, when Brandenburger cut loose and, and he just gives him his head. A perfect example of Auftrag's tactic. He had delegated the task. He trusted Brandenburger, who just ran riot through the Red Army and tore them to pieces. Then, from then on, his memoirs start to get a little bit more dodgy because he's complaining constantly, I'm being sent this way and now we were sent that way and this was such a diversion of, of resources. And he's right, it is a diversion of resources, but this is what, you, what happens when you invade an enormous country on diverging axes of advance. You, the only mobile forces you have are the Panzer Corps. So guess what? They're the ones who are going to be shuffled around to try to fill the gaps. And, you know, that's, that's the reality of it. Even, you know, uh, even a general staff candidate uh, at staff college should have looked at that map and said, we have three army groups heading in diametrically different directions. Mm -hmm. How do we intend to fill the gaps between them? And yet people like Manstein allegedly didn't. Anyway, so he then ends up down in 11th Army, down in, in South Ukraine, gets involved in the fighting in Crimea, his conquest of Crimea. Uh, yeah, job well done. Excellent. Good, good use of resources. He didn't have he, he didn't have very much by way of armored forces, but he used them very skillfully. Absolutely excellent. No problem with that. Um, he's shuffled off up north in preparation for Nordlicht and the attack on Leningrad. Gets sucked into the fighting to stop the latest failed Soviet attempt to break the siege ring, and then comes his great moment with the encirclement of Stalingrad. And you know, I'm not going to take anything away from this. This was probably him at the pinnacle of his career. He did an outstanding job when it came to uh, 
mounting the, the relief effort and then restoring the German line along the Donets. That in particular was a brilliant um, set of maneuvers. To an extent, the pieces fell into place just simply because of where they were retreating to. But, you know, even still, I could sit down in front of a chess board with the pieces in winning positions and I'd probably screw it up. You know, he had the pieces in the right position and he used them really, really well. And that's absolutely outstanding. Um, but here again, I start to have problems with this. When you think about what happened, so first Panzer Army has been pulled out of the Caucasus. Um, all of the units that have been improvised in the defensive lines outside Stalingrad are pulling back over the Donets. Um, you have Hauser with the SS Panzer Corps, etc., 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 all of that stuff. And you then mount these counterattacks that destroy a large amount of Soviet armor, and that's very good. To my mind, the missing bit in his memoirs is I would have loved to see just a paragraph on the unsung heroes of the logistics department of his army group who managed to make sure there was sufficient fuel and ammunition in the right places for these divisions to do their job. You know, we're talking, if you superimpose the map of um, that part of Ukraine on Western Europe, you get an idea of the sheer scale of, uh, of, of this, these operations. And for men to ensure that there was sufficient stuff awaiting the Panzer divisions when they arrived, that is just an incredible bit of art. And, you know, he just takes the credit of it and says, yeah, thanks. I thought I did really well. Well done. That's great. You know, um, yeah, Terry, I agree. Winter Storm probably wasn't uh, his finest moment, but I've got to say, I think given the resources that were available, um, I'm not convinced that actually anyone could have done any better. And to an extent, I suspect that hand on heart, Manstein probably knew it was not going to succeed. But I don't, and I don't say this to belittle it, for the sake of appearances, he had to do it. You know, mm. you had to make an attempt. He made an attempt. It did well, largely because, you know, Six Panzer fought very, very well. Um, but in the end, the Soviets fought rather better. And it wasn't just by sheer weight of numbers. They actually outmaneuvered us uh, uh, to a considerable extent. Anyway, so that's his great moment. And then it all starts to go wrong. Because let's remember, the Battle of Kursk was largely his idea. Now, in fairness to him, he did want to have this at the earliest possible opportunity after the spring thaw, and it was the Fuhrer who kept delaying it. But nevertheless, he was asked, you know, is it still on? And he kept saying, yeah, yeah, it's on. Okay. It really wasn't. By then, it should have been pretty damned obvious. They were going to have to smash their way through so many lines of defense. It, at best, it was going to be a bit of a Pyrrhic victory. And then we get to the bit where I really start, you know, um, going off on. You think I've gone off on already? Just wait. Um, because, you know, he, now his reputation is built on something that never happens. Because in his memoirs, he talks about the great backhand alternative, where he could have pulled his troops back across the Dnieper, created a powerful panzer group um, up in the north. And then as the Red Army advances across Ukraine, central Ukraine, we hit them from the north, and it'll be a glorious counterattack, and it'll be like the recovery on the Donets only in reverse, and it'll be great. And Hitler didn't let me do this. And was, he, what, a, what a terrible man he was. And, you know, we, we could have done so well. Well, OK, this is make-believe. It didn't happen. We don't know how that operation would have unfolded. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of a single major panzer operation um, from Kursk onwards of that order of magnitude that actually remotely succeeded. The Red Army had got really, really good at stopping panzer divisions. The use of the pack front, the use of their own armor in counterattacks, etc. You know, they did they did a really, really good job. And again, Manstein never, ever gives credit to his enemies on this. There's never any recognition of, you know, that the other guys did a good job. Um, so he then built, he then carries on commanding what's now Army Group South again as it pulls back across central Ukraine, then into western Ukraine. And all the time he's talking about um, the, the solution to this was to create a powerful panzer group in the north, pull out in the south, and then strike them from the north. Uh, okay, 
where are you going to get those panzers from? He couldn't release any of his divisions. They were too busy, busy firefighting in the front line. And in his position, he must have known that there was no, alter, no possibility of pulling these off a quiet front. There weren't any quiet fronts anywhere uh, by then. So again, it's all make-believe. Oh, if I had been given this extra army in the north, I could have done this or that. There weren't any extra armies available to do anything of that sort of magnitude. Um, so again, a lot of his sort of um, a lot of his reputation, it seems to me, that it's built upon this memoir with so many stories in it of mm. stuff that just didn't happen. You then also got this whole business of um, his enormous rows with the Führer, and he goes back and he, you know, has a, a slanging match with Adolf. And you know, when even when he goes back and he's told that um, Modell is going to replace him, and and Hitler asks him, "Do you think Modell is the man for the job?" And um, Manstein says, "Yes, uh, I, I think he is." And Hitler enthusiastically said to me, um, "Yes, Modell will get the best out of the troops." And I told him, "The troops have always given their best for me." And you know, thinking, "Yeah, great line," but this is a conversation between. Between two people, one of whom is now dead. We only have your word that you actually had the, the balls to say that, you know. So how reliable are Manstein's memoirs? Well, a lawyer will tell you that if you catch somebody lying in court once, pretty much the rest of their evidence becomes highly questionable. Mm -hmm. You then have to almost, you almost have to re-establish their credentials before the judge, before the jury, before you can, you know, have credible evidence. So where are the holes in Manstein's evidence? Well, now, he rest, he says in this book um, that um, when I received the Commissar order and the severity order, I refused to pass them on. He was successfully prosecuted for war crimes with part of the evidence against him being signed copies of that or those orders that he had handed on. When he was commander of uh, 11th Army in Crimea in that first winter of uh, the Eastern Front War, he arranged a swap with Otto Ohlendorf, who was commander of Einsatzgruppe D. Uh, he arranged a swap of several truckloads of small arms ammunition in return for civilian winter coats. Did it never occur to him where Ohlendorf had got several thousand uh, civilian coats? Did it never occur to him what Ohlendorf was going to do with so much rifle and, and pistol ammunition? You know, of course he knew full well what was going on. He was completely complicit in those war crimes. And again, getting back to my bugbear, he knew about the July plot. He chose to look the other way. And I know people are going to say these people took their personal oath to Hitler very seriously. But I've got to say... You know, in the end, you knew this was not Hitler's army. This was Germany's army. Yeah, true. And their inability to differentiate between those two, to my mind, condemns them. And it, it reduces their intellectual stature in my eyes. Anyway, that is my... The, the prosecution rests, my lord. Well, I was thank you, brilliant. I was hoping to ask you about Yodel there because I wanted to kind of bring in this whole the, the whole staff officer thing because yes. you know Manstein and Guderian being kind of field generals, I wanted to bring in that the inner circle. But the fact we haven't got any time just means I'll have to invite you back again to talk about the inner <laughs> circle because uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that was that was the curveball I was going to throw you because I you know with you know Guderian lived a few years after war, Manstein lived quite a few years after war. Um, Yodel, what was it, forty six? I think he 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 he's, he snuffed it. But I would, but we'll just do that another time for it. That's it. It's just, to. It's, it's, to. Gives me an excuse to bring you back there. But fantastic, <laughs> folks. No time for questions because in a minute and a half, theoretically, I'm starting another one of these. Haven't heard from my guests, but hopefully you'll be around. Prit, it's been a led, uh, your legend. I love talking to you. I will come up to Scotland and have a whiskey with you at some point. But in the meantime, I will you see must. you all in about a minute and a half. Cheers, Thank everybody. Thank you all. Cheers. Bye.